and welcome to Risky Talk, the podcast where we talk about risk and how to talk about risk. I'm your host, David Spiegelhalter, and this episode is all about the spread of misinformation on social media. Who's behind it? Why is it so effective? And what can we do about it? We need government regulation, particularly focused around transparency of social media data now. But we want to empower people to be able to make informed decisions by unveiling the techniques of manipulation. We don't want to get anywhere near legislating for what content is true and what is false. Ultimately, in the long run, the best guarantee of informed public debate is freedom of expression. Now, here on Risky Talk, we're usually exploring how to communicate evidence and information in the best way. So today is a little unusual, because today we're exploring how misleading evidence and ideas get spread via social media. And that covers the whole spectrum, from individuals expressing factually misguided views, but ones they sincerely hold, what you might call misinformation, to media organisations distorting the truth for clicks, and all the way through to expensive, choreographed propaganda campaigns designed to deceive through spreading information that they know to be false. And this is, of course, known as disinformation. But this is not just about the groups creating and communicating the content. It's also about the social media platforms whose algorithms are carefully trained to guide content towards those most likely to be receptive. And this stuff really can be a matter of life and death. COVID conspiracies and vaccine misinformation have undoubtedly been responsible for avoidable deaths. And for example, Facebook has a vast influence and has been accused of spreading content connected with incidents of political violence around the world, from the capital siege in Washington to the attacks on the Rohingya in Myanmar and many others. So, to help me unpick who's behind the misinformation, why it's so effective and what we should be doing about it, I'm joined by four stellar guests, all on the front line of the information war. Chloe Colliver leads a team of analysts studying disinformation and extremism online at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a non-profit organisation dedicated to combating disinformation and polarisation around the world. Laura Edelson co-leads the Cybersecurity for Democracy project at New York University, which studies how paid advertising and recommendation algorithms amplify misinformation on social media. Earlier this year, Facebook cut off their access to data they were using to investigate the spread of misinformation. Will Moy is the CEO of Full Fact, the UK's premier fact-checking organisation, and they regularly call out politicians and journalists and respond to misleading information going viral online. And they've also been working with Facebook as an independent fact-checker since 2019. Sander van der Linden is Professor of Social Psychology at the University of Cambridge, where he leads the Social Decision-Making Laboratory. He's got a book in the pipeline on the psychology of misinformation, and his team have developed a series of hugely successful games where users learn to spot fake news, which has been dubbed a psychological vaccine. And Sander is also a veteran risky talker. Ah, this is an awesome panel, and thank you all so much for turning up. So, as usual in these podcasts, let's kick off by establishing who's doing the communicating and what they are trying to achieve. And I'm going to come to you first, Chloe. What kind of groups and organizations are using social media platforms for deliberate disinformation campaigns? And can you give us a brief overview of who's doing this stuff? What are they actually trying to achieve? Thanks, David. There's a broad range of actors who are involved in creating, promoting and amplifying intentional false information online. Um, the first of those we might want to think about are hostile foreign states. So governments and government agencies around the world that have a political or financial interest in uh, spreading fake information. We've, we have a lot of evidence about uh, governments, including the Russian government, the Iranian government, but Oxford Internet Institute has found that over 70 countries worldwide have the ability to do this kind of thing. So that's one category. But we're also talking about domestic actors. So we might think about uh, extremist groups and terrorist organizations who use false information to try and recruit and radicalize individuals online, political parties and political 
supporter groups are also involved in this kind of activity. Um, and finally, uh, those who are seeking commercial gain, so who have a high motivation to try and make money off spreading false information um, because they can make money off it. And that might be just a, a kid in his back room who's paid to spread this kind of content, or it might be a mastermind who's running an entire dark PR company. So we're talking about a pretty broad spread of actors here. Can I ask a very specific question? I mentioned vaccine conspiracies as largely misinformation, that people genuinely believe it. Are there is there vaccine disinformation, people who are knowingly spreading false information about it? There absolutely is vaccine disinformation. And there have been a number of studies that show how much money um, specific influencers have made of spreading vaccine disinformation to people they know might be vulnerable to receiving it. Whoa, that's pretty rough. You uh, mentioned specific countries uh, that have been uh, carrying out these campaigns. Could you, can you give us more, some more precise examples? Absolutely. Um, so I'll take one example from the COVID uh, environment that we're so um, actively interested in at the moment. And that's the uh, trend in kind of vaccine geopolitics playing out through disinformation from foreign states. So um, some people have called this vaccine sovereignty and, and other things. But we've seen both um, Russian state media and also Chinese state media involved in spreading disinformation about other countries' vaccines um, to try and undermine trust in other countries' vaccine development and to promote their own vaccines as the best possible option. So that's both a geopolitical and kind of a commercial interest coming out there. Um, but on the much longer time span of these things, we've seen a number of foreign states involve themselves in elections to try and shift audiences' attitudes towards the candidate or the party that might favour their own power game and agenda the most. So the most famous example of that would, of course, be the Russian uh, government's internet research agency and its involvement trying to interfere in the 2016 US presidential election. But even just in last year's US presidential election, the FBI announced a number of examples of foreign state interference, including on much smaller tech platforms like platforms called Gab uh, and Parler, which are notoriously homes of already quite polarized audiences on the far left or the far right. So there's a clear strategy there to try and target already quite polarised audiences and to drive mis- and disinformation at them um, so that they become even more radicalised or polarised. Have you any idea whether the um, attempts to uh, promote the Russian and Chinese vaccines uh, over and above the, the, the others, uh, whether that's been successful? It's very difficult to draw a line of causation between real world decision making and online information of any kind. That's a very difficult thing to do. But I think it's clear that in terms of the dominance of the conversation online and the share of voice that some of these conversations are getting, um, we should be concerned, especially in parts of the world where, for example, China has enormous business interests interest in infrastructure, like in Africa, um, that it might be starting to dominate the vaccine conversation there and that that might change policy decisions around where vaccines are being bought from and who has control of that kind of rollout. Okay, thanks so much, Chloe. Um, and you're Laura, your research with the Cybersecurity for Democracy Group has looked at suspect news sources which spread their content via Facebook in particular. So who are the groups generally behind these low quality news sources? Well, what tends to be motivating them? Thanks, David. So uh, just to pick up on the the sort of framing that Chloe gave us to start of of the actors involved here um, in terms of the the sort of low quality news misinformative news though those are typically done by domestic actors and commercial actors so um, there is a, a sort of a cottage industry of extreme partisan news misinformative news that's kind of always going on in the background, particularly in the United States, uh, but that really sort of goes into overdrive around election periods. Um, I think people don't fully appreciate, though, the role of commercial actors in this space. Um, so there are commercial actors who literally, they will spend the period of time between elections building out these uh, Facebook pages with an audience, with a very particular audience that maybe isn't isn't particularly political, and then they will turn around and sell that page and sell that audience when an election rolls around. The other, you know, real commercial play here are, uh, and we see this a lot in in the vaccine mis and disinformation space, are people who 
want to convince people, for example, that uh, vaccines are harmful so that they can turn around and sell those people other products. Um, this is where nutraceuticals uh, are a really huge business. But there's also a lot of other sort of weird products. Like there are people who will tell you that masks are very dangerous for your health, except for the one mask that they sell. Um, so there's all these sorts of commercial appeals where I'm going to convince you that all these things are dangerous, and then I'm going to, and then once you're convinced of this via my news channel, I'll sell you some other product. Wow, I mean, I, I just feel really naive because I, I, I don't see this stuff because I, I do use Twitter a lot, and there I tend to see a lot of misinformation, but but actually from people who seem to genuinely believe it, and so I do find it shocking. Um, as I said, feel very naive that people are actually just actively trying to make money out of this. Okay, we've heard about some of the groups responsible for creating the misleading content, but what about the platforms themselves? And they aren't creating the stuff that gets shared, uh, but a lot of their success is down, of course, to the way they curate and filter all their information and even amplify it. What you see as an individual user you know, is determined by their algorithms their recommendation algorithms. So, um, Laura, staying with you, you know, what's the objective of the platforms themselves? You know, how do these recommendation algorithms help them achieve it? I think the thing that is really important to remember when trying to think about platforms' motives here is that if you are a platform like Facebook, you are an ad platform. You sell advertising, and advertisers are your customers. Users are your product. So. Platforms like Facebook, they are trying to maximize the amount of attention and engagement that they get from users because fundamentally that attention is what they sell. That is their product. And I think this is where a lot of what we've been learning over the last uh, many months and years from independent research like mine, from some of the information that's come out from internal research leaks from Facebook, is that there really is a tension between user safety and user engagement. Because some of the most harmful content um, that does wind up being promoted by content recommendation algorithms, it is promoted by these algorithms because it is also highly engaging. Will, what do you feel about this? I mean, you're working with Facebook on on their content. Uh, how do you feel about the way in which that content is spread to their users? Well, I think they have some real challenges that they are not living up to. Um, Full Fact works with Facebook in one particular way. There's something called the third-party fact-checking program, which is Facebook sending a list of content that it's spotted on Facebook that it thinks might be untrue to independent third-party fact-checkers to be fact-checked. And then when they get the fact-checks back from Full Fact and from other fact-checkers around the world that are part of this program, they do a few different things. Firstly, they show people who are seeing the content, this has been fact-checked, you might like to read the fact-check. Secondly, if you're about to share the content, you might get a, a notice saying, this has been fact-checked. Do you want to read the fact-check before you share? You can decide to share or not. You can decide to read it or not, but you get a prompt. And the third thing is they feed it into their ranking algorithms to reduce the spread of content that fact-checkers have found to be false. And they say, and we can't verify this independently, but they say that reduces the spread of false content by 80% after it's been fact-checked. It's worth saying Facebook has a program like this and a network of fact checkers around the world it works with. YouTube does not. And YouTube and disinformation on YouTube is a clear threat to public health. Um, so it's really important we scrutinize these programs. It's also really important we don't let the people who aren't doing anything get away with sitting quietly in the background and hoping other people get more grief than they do. And that is clearly the tactic that other internet companies are taking. Laura. So I just want to. Um, kind of amplify something that Will was saying. We are talking about a lot of this in context of Facebook because um, Facebook has has done two things that is very different from particularly YouTube. One, uh, Facebook has taken some limited steps towards public transparency. That's why I have been able to do the work that I have done because of those steps. And two, 
Facebook did do a fair amount of internal research into the effects of its own platform. And I certainly have a problem with doing that research, seeing those results, and then not taking steps. But they certainly do deserve credit for at least doing that research. We don't know if YouTube has done similar research. We just don't have transparency into it. So I, I think that's an important point to bring up in context of everything around uh, platform incentives, because YouTube certainly does have all these same incentives. Other platform like other platforms like TikTok that are really highly driven by uh, content promotion algorithms have the exact same incentives. We just know more about how these things play out on Facebook. But, but Laurie, I mean, the, the, re Facebook revoked your access to some data recently. I mean, how do you feel about that? <laughs> what, what, why was that? What, what happened then? So in addition to the work I do with data provided by Facebook, um, I also have an independent crowdsourcing data collection project where people can install a browser extension that my team builds and maintains for anonymously contributing ad data to, to my project. So people can install this, this browser plugin and then ads that they're shown on Facebook or YouTube will be sent back to my project after they're stripped of all, um, you know, any, any kind of identifying information. Facebook uh, doesn't like that project. Um, there are certainly other similar projects. I think one thing that that my team does that I don't think anyone else does is we actually publish that data so that other researchers can use it as well. And I think Facebook doesn't necessarily like uh, that project. And so in retaliation for the fact that we've refused to stop doing this, they cut off our access to Facebook provided data. I think that this is a mistake. I think that the purpose a lot of, of a lot of my work is to make Facebook a safer platform for Facebook's users. I think that if Facebook wants to really move the ball forward on, on uh, dealing with the very real user safety issues on their platform, that they would do more work with independent researchers. Um, but you know, I'm I probably have some some motivated reasoning going on there. Well, no, Laura's completely right about that, and she's. Uh... She's not blowing her trumpet very hard, but the project that Laura is running is hugely important. There are basically only two ways you can get data out of the internet companies at the moment. Either you do it with their cooperation, and there's precious little of that, or you do it without their cooperation by going directly to end users and asking them to share their data. That's what Laura's doing, and that gives us an independent insight into how the internet companies are shaping public debate, not just in their own countries, whether that's China or America, but in countries all around the world. And it's the only way we can do it, short of legislation that actually holds these companies to account and forces transparency, which is badly needed. So Laura is doing path-breaking work and to have it obstructed in this way is actually really damaging to our understanding of what the problems are. And without understanding the problems, it's very hard to design effective proportionate solutions. Yeah, and and uh, I, I do get the point that uh, Facebook gets a, a, a lot of attention on this, partly because they do engage with these issues to some extent, and we shouldn't let off the the platforms that are actually just keeping quiet completely. Okay, so we've heard about what's driving some of these groups responsible for disinformation campaigns. We've heard about what the, some of the social media platforms might be trying to do about it. So, um, well... You're on the sort of opposing side of this information warfare, your, your fact-checking organization, Full Fact. Um, you know, at the Winton Centre, we got this motto to inform, not persuade, you know, our grandiose ideas. Uh, how does that compare with what your mission is at Full Fact? What are you trying to do? Exactly the same. We're trying to make sure people have the information they would want to make up their own minds. There are lots of people whose job it is to persuade you to get a vaccine. Um, that's not our job. Our job is to make sure you have reliable information you can make up your own mind about and make your own decisions think you live with them or not. Um, so fact-checking can't be a tool of persuasion, really for two reasons. One is the whole integrity of it is about 
assisting people to make up their own minds and ensuring a reliable information base. The other thing is if you want to persuade people, you talk to their emotions. And that's not what fact checking is about. Fact checking is pretty dry. <laughs> and, you know, only really if you want to know the answer, are you going to really want to care about reading a bunch of fact checks? So this is the kind of thing we're doing at the moment. We teamed up with a charity called Pregnant Then Screwed, which uh, counters discrimination against pregnant women. And they talk to lots of pregnant women who are currently wildly confused because the, the message on what's safe and what's not safe during the pandemic has been changing left, right and centre. And it's been very, very difficult, very worrying time for people. So we teamed up with them to provide a WhatsApp helpline where their members and pregnant women generally can get in touch with us and say, I want to know what's going on about this. This is my question. And within 24 hours, get a reply saying this is the best information we have. This is what we do know. This is what we don't know. And you can make up your own mind from there. That, I think, is valuable. It's not the whole picture. Somebody needs to be making the case why vaccines are important and so on. But our job is to firstly help people make up their own minds and secondly challenge people who misrepresent information. Ask them to correct the record and point out how that is happening and what can be done to reduce that. So we regularly go to major media outlets, to politicians, and ask them to correct the record about things they've said. Um, and we are now actively involved in the online safety bill, looking at how internet companies are regulated so the misinformation is less of a threat, um, but bearing in mind that what the online safety bill is really regulating is what you and I can do online. And the last thing we should be encouraging anyone to do is restrict our freedom of expression in the cause of um, protecting things that those in power think are important. And so getting that balance right is incredibly important in that context. And we provide an evidence base and policy ideas to contribute to that. And do you ever find it challenging trying not to change, not to take sides uh, on issues that you might feel quite strongly about? Um, yeah, I think so. And one of the things we do, it's a bit of a problem because I hope that the kinds of people who listen to your podcast might apply for jobs at Full Fact. But one of the things we do when we uh, recruit people is we ask them to talk about difficult issues, specifically to see if they can talk about different sides of the same issue, even where they might have commitments. Because actually nobody is free of ideas and I don't want to hire anyone who doesn't have any ideas in their heads anyway. <laughs> but being able to see things from different sides and being being able to respect other people's right to make their own decision about it, even if you disagree with it, is what I think makes fact checkers good fact checkers and people suitable to work at full fact. It is difficult. And I think realistically, my colleagues are spending all day, every day, um, watching people talk about disease and death. And in many cases, as others have said, watching people lie about disease and death and give other people health advice that is dangerous to their health. <laughs> and it is hard to step back from that and say, we don't want to argue the other side, we want to help you make up your own mind. But other people have to do their bit of that equation. Our job is to hold people to account when they are misleading others. We can challenge their behavior, and we should and we must, but to give people information that they make their own mind up about. Laura? I just wanted to say that this is something that I personally struggle so much with. Um, you know, I'm a computer scientist. It's it's my job to sort of study these ecosystems of information and try to understand, um, you know, how can we better evaluate the the risk that something may be misinformation so we can develop better uh, better systems. Um, but at the same time, you are doing that in an environment that is awful, that is really toxic, and you know, I have a I have a child under five who can't be vaccinated right now. And as a parent, to look at some of this content that is taking advantage of the the fear that, that other parents feel and to take that fear and, and try to convince people not to do the things that will make them safer, but instead to like buy some powder, it's awful. And to then look at that stuff and then have to go back and do my job, which is, again, about the sort of network analysis and, and looking for these broader pa uh, patterns, it's very, very hard. And a big part of why I can do that is I know that there are other organizations out there that are trying to advocate for better, safer education, that are trying to encourage people to, to be vaccinated. Um, I really have to 
compartmentalize and just think, okay, I'm going to do my job. And there is someone else that is out there really trying to fight this stuff. But if I, if I try to be an advocate, then I can't do the science and someone's got to do the science. I, I think it's, that's really well spoken. And, and uh, we got to realize that we're all part of a, an ecology in, 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 in this work. Yeah. Okay. This is really good. Got a sense of the different players who are creating the content and curating the misleading content and fact checkers like Will pushing back and and Laura working out what is actually going on with these algorithms. So let's turn to the audience, um, which is you know which is all of us. You know we use social media to some extent or another. You know and uh, so Sander, your group, they've had big success developing games that train users to spot fake news. So what can you tell us about why some misinformation is often so compelling and persuasive and how you've tried to make your games um, compelling and persuasive <laughs> to play, to engage in? Well, I think there's two sort of broad, sometimes competing theories of why people fall for misinformation. I think one is a, a fairly more innocent account, which is sometimes called the inattention account, right? We, we're on social media, we have good intentions, uh, but we're simply bombarded by information and there's, you know, there's too much of it. We can't process it all, right? We have sort of limited, uh, we're limited in our attention and our capacity. And so we're overwhelmed and, uh, you know, other sort of incentives get the best of us instead of, you know, trying to attend to uh, what's the most accurate story to share on social media. Now, another account suggests that people are deeply motivated by their social, religious, political, and spiritual identities that lead them to selectively attend to facts and even on purpose spread misinformation that promotes their own groups or, you know, even information uh, that may say some negative things about groups that they don't like. And so it's, it's, it's really more of a social motivation for why people are susceptible to and spread misinformation. So I think in our research, we've kind of found that, you know, both accounts are, are clearly true. Sometimes people are duped because they're not paying attention. And sometimes, you know, people are motivated by um, other things uh, that values that we find important that are expressed in news stories that lead us to affirm our identity to, to different groups or denigrate um, other people with whom we're not agreeing. Um, and so, you know, what can you do about it? I think broadly, there's a few mechanisms. Um, there's fact checking. Of course, Will's doing this great work. Uh, there's there's debunking. Um, and then there's what we call pre-bunking, which is the idea that, you know, we've worked on for the last few years and we've tried to, to gamify and um, I should say up front, you know, at the Wind Center, we're always transparent. I should say, you know, I work with Facebook and WhatsApp and Google and, and all of these companies and I receive uh, funding from them and I have access to their data and so on. And so I like to say that I'm an independent researcher, but I think it's you know still important for people to know that, that we do uh, work with them on implementing um, some of our research and interventions. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that that I've been saying to Facebook for a long time, because yeah, I, I advise them on their independent third-party fact checker um, program, particularly around climate and climate risks, because they don't have specialized fact checkers in the area of climate change, which is a huge gap um, at the moment, um, that there's an opportunity to not just act retroactively. See, what, what happens on these platforms is that misinformation goes viral and now they have a problem and now they need to have people correct it. And sure, fact checks reduce the amount of misinformation that people see, but it's always damage control after the fact. They're always running, running behind. And so we've been trying to encourage them to be more proactive and to try to pre-bunk uh, where they can. And this idea of pre-bunking um, can be implemented in the form of what we call psychological inoculation, which follows the vaccine metaphor exactly. Um, you preemptively expose people to a weakened dose of the types of misinformation that's out there or the techniques that people use to spread misinformation so that people can build up cognitive or intellectual antibodies so that they become immune to it when they're really exposed to it live on the platform at some point in the future. Um, and this really requires thinking proactively about the problem. And of course, one what's an interesting way of doing that? We found that actually through games that simulate a social media feed for people where in a controlled environment we can expose people uh, to the techniques that are used to do people online um, in weakened dose so in weakened form right um, uh, that is actually helps people become uh, better at spotting fake news they feel more confident in their own abilities and they report that they want to share less fake news when they go through our interventions uh, and so what are these sort of techniques um, we're not necessarily telling people what's true or false you know like like 
Will was saying, you know, I, I don't think it's a, always a job of the scientist uh, um, to tell people what they need to believe, but we want to empower people to be able to make informed decisions by unveiling the techniques of manipulation. So we expose people to weakened doses of how to use frame, emotional framing, uh, polarizing people using particular content, conspiracy theories, trolling. Um, and so once people have become, you know, exposed to these techniques by actually actively um, playing a role and implementing them in a simulated environment, uh, people, you know, once you know how a magic trick works, you're not going to be duped by it again. That's the idea. Okay, here's a tricky business. Um, you know, many people are trying to persuade us of things. And, you know, we've, we're talking about people who, spreading disinformation and misinformation, trying to persuade us. But also, governments are trying to persuade us to get vaccinated. There's lots of persuasive, compelling narratives out there using imagery and using advertising techniques for that. And they both can often tend to use similar ways of just looking at particular examples, arousing our emotions, avoiding uncertainties. Everyone's doing it. Um and I suppose that I, I'd like to open this out to anybody. So I said, you know, they don't want to decide what's true or false necessarily, but how do we decide, you know, what is a, um, in a way, a, a trustworthy, compelling narrative and, and what isn't? Chloe. Yeah, if I could come in there just briefly, David, I think that there are some standards for things like news reporting and journalism that might be helpful in slightly retilting our information ecosystem online so that it isn't quite as confusing for people. Uh, as, as you say, there's persuasion coming at you from all sides. But at the moment, some of the um, less persuasive but more fact-based uh, information that, that people might find useful in framing their decisions is getting lost in a myriad of persuasion. And some platforms have tried to develop um, kind of promotion and curation systems for trusted news sources. Um, it's very opaque at the moment how they do that, how they select what a trusted news source is, and also how effective any kind of efforts to promote or amplify that content above others might be. But I think we need to take a step back and think about the the kind of quagmire of information people are, are steeped in at the moment and try and find ways to give them some sense of control back as to how they can selectively choose what they might see appearing in front of them. And, and there are some regulatory initiatives in the UK and in the, at the EU level that are that are trying a little bit to give users some sense of control over whether they're seeing all of that persuasive content, whether they're seeing content just from trusted sources or whether they're seeing content just from their own personal networks. And that might be one step towards slightly disintegrating this very kind of complicated net of information that we're they're swimming in at the moment. Yeah. Will, you, you seem to suggest that your work has to be intrinsically dull. And uh, <laughs> I just want to publicly apologise to all my colleagues. That's very unfair. <laughs> <laughs> and and yet I find your the articles on full fact you know utterly gripping. I mean, is that just means I'm a bit strange? I mean, I, I guess what I'm getting at is we write about a very wide range of things. Our, our job is to go out there and, and essentially find people who are misleading other people and challenge them and expose how that happens. And that means that one day we might be. I mean, we've been, we've just been writing about COVID for the last year and a half. It's been kind of relentless in so many ways for so many people. Um, but on a typical day, we might be writing about uh, firefighters pensions and what's going on with the budget and what's going on viral online and so on and not everybody is interested in all of those things so you know we're not telling you stories we're giving you facts we are exposing wrongdoing and I think people do find that interesting but um, really people find it most interesting when it matters to their lives and that's, I think, the most important service. It's not that everybody wants to be informed about everything that's possibly wrong on the internet, <laughs> as if any of us had time. It's that when we make a decision, we want to have the facts that we can rely on to make that decision. And that, by the way, is one of the benefits of integrating fact-checking into the internet company's products like Facebook, is you're giving people the information at the moment they're making the decision to read something or to share something. Um, but ultimately, to go back to your question, uh, which Chloe answered, you don't have to do too much digging to get at least a first line of defense against being misled. And we suggest people ask just three simple questions. Firstly, where's it from? What's the source? Do they have an agenda? Do you have a reason to trust them? Are they in any way checked by a third party? Secondly, what's missing? 
what's behind the headline before you share something, actually click through and see the whole story, see if anyone else is talking about it. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, how does it make you feel? Because so often misinformation that's going to hurt you is deliberately designed to make you angry or scared. And then you share it because you want to help the people you're sharing it with. Because so many people who are sharing damaging COVID misinformation are doing it to help people, to help their family, help their friends get through this pandemic. So taking a beat when something makes you feel scared or afraid or angry and deciding, can I really trust it, is really important. And in that sense, fact-checking is not there to get you riled up. Fact-checking is there to help you take a breath and kind of say, actually, do I need to do anything about this or can I leave it to one side? Yes. Laura. I think one thing that is absolutely fascinating to me about the importance of these highly emotive appeals, um, which we, by the way, do see associated with higher engagement on social media. Um, if content has a really emotive appeal, it gets higher engagement. One of the things that I found so fascinating about some of that internal research into why this is the case is sometimes uh, that that highly emotive content is really engaging because people, because it convinces people, and other times it is highly con it is highly engaging because people either are worried about it and so they engage with it and they reshare it to ask their friends, is this true? That's something we see. And then also there's something else where people will reshare this highly emotive content to say, this is fake, this isn't real. And then they will reshare it on that basis, which then of course just amplifies it more. And, and that's the point that Sandra will be able to tell you, things you see more often stick in your head and um, there is a psychological effect of simple frequency actually leading people to take things in as if they're true. So, Sander. Yeah, I just, uh, let me give you a few fun examples from Facebook. I think it speaks well to, to Will and, and Laura's uh, example. So one of the ways in which we design the, the way that the fact checks are presented on Facebook is in a particular format. And so, you know, presenting a fact check is, is not a neutral thing, right? You, ch you choose the way that the fact check is presented. And so one of the things we try to do now is to avoid repeating the myth too often, because, you know, the more often you repeat the myth, the stronger the connection people have in their memory with the myth, but you have to make some choices. So we often adopt what's called a truth sandwich format. So you start with the facts, then you, you, you explain the myth, why it's wrong, and then you end again on the facts. Um, but that's a way to help people remember what the facts are. Um, and somebody has to take a stance on, on what those facts indeed are and, and what, is, what is incorrect. And so I do think, credit to Facebook, that they now do take a stance on what, what are the facts on climate change and what's misinformation, something they weren't willing to do uh, a few years ago. Um, and so that's, that's interesting. But, you know, the way we designed a fact check, it is, according to us, best principles of when we test people, how are they most likely to remember um, truthful information, what's least likely to, to lead to uh, misinformation sticking in people's memory and so on. And so, you know, it's, it's based on certain principles uh, with a certain goal in mind, of course, to, 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 to try to actually do this. Um, um, but it's not, I think, you know, the source of the, a lot of fact checking is about sources, but what, what I find so interesting is that if you look at the story that went most viral on Facebook uh, in the first quarter of, I think, last year, it was the Chicago Tribune, a highly reputable outlet. Um, the headline was technically not false. Uh, you know, um, healthy doctor dies two weeks after getting the COVID vaccine. The doctor died and he got the COVID vaccine. Those were two independent events, but the way that it's framed to influence people uh, is the issue here. And I think that that type of content is is sometimes trickier to address. And that's why we train people to, to recognize these sort of influence techniques because they operate at a more um, subtle level. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's mainstream media too. So when we did something, just the last point to reinforce what Laura was saying, we looked at millions of, of data points from Facebook and Twitter. And one of the things that we found in a publication that came out a few months ago is that not only do emotional words increase retreat rates and moral emotional words, one of the biggest predictors was actually whether you're talking about the outgroup. So if you're a liberal and you're talking about a conservative and vice versa, and particularly in a negative way. Now, Gizmodo ran some sort of stories that Cambridge nerds set out to prove the obvious. When you dunk the other side, you get more retweets or something like that. Um, but it's not so obvious because all of these big companies keep uh, contesting 
uh, that uh, emotional content or negative content or more extreme content gets more engagement on their platforms, right? But what happened was that we wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. They gave us a suggested headline for the research. We said, no, that's ridiculous. And so the next day, they ran with it anyway. So the headline was, Facebook really, really, really doesn't want to address their extremism problem. Um, and so, you know, this, it got them lots of engagement. I mean, the, the, the article went viral. Of yeah. course, Facebook, Facebook put out a super defensive press release the next day, you know, complaining about me. But, but it's, you know, they, they, they were right. They were right saying, first, we didn't look at extremism. We just looked at regular content and stuff that was high in emotion and morality and, and uh, outgroup negativity received higher engagement. But it's true that it wasn't technically violent or, or other types of extremism. Um, some of their other arguments are a standard playbook that they have in defending themselves against that social media, you know, that, that social media isn't the root cause of polarization because it existed before social media and so on. Um, but I emailed the Washington Post. I said, you know, this, the, you know, this headline is ridiculous um, and said, no, it proves the point of your study exactly that, you know, if you have if you if you make the headline more emotional and get people riled up, we get more retweets. And I was like, okay, you may think that's funny, but but it, in fact, it got me lots of trouble. So, you know, there you go. That's that's a terrible story. And, it, and it, But it just goes to show that although we've been talking about social media, a number of times people have brought up the fact that mainstream media is not immune to, to this sort of thing. And, um, okay, let's just, uh, you know, come to the essential point, which we've been covering quite a lot throughout the whole discussion about what to do about it. We've heard about, um, you know, Sanders on training people to be better at dealing with it, um, of, of helping platforms develop uh, the identification of, of, of misinformation, of fact-checking to, to help people, to inform them. Um, what about regulation? Uh, you know, what do uh, my wonderful panel think about the potential regulation, given the fact that there are bills going through in country after country about this at the moment. Laura. We need government regulation, particularly focused around transparency of social media data. Now we need it yesterday and we really need it before, you know, any, any Western democracy has an election and preferably any election at all. It is the most important thing that we can do to improve the online ecosystem. Chloe. Yeah, I would back that up, but I just say it's also a really difficult thing to do. But I think there are positive signs from the EU's Digital Services Act draft and from the UK's Online Safety Bill draft that show that you can try to take an approach to regulation that doesn't just think about removing content and trying to adjudicate what's good and what's bad online, but instead is focused on what Laura mentions, which is around transparency and accountability. And uh, that's particularly important when we're thinking about this and misinformation, because we don't want to get anywhere near legislating for what content is true and what is false. But we do want to make sure that users have the services they need to make decisions fairly, that they understand where that information is coming from and why, why they're being targeted with certain things so they can make decisions accordingly. And so that the platforms can be held up to their own standards that they that they commit to in contracts with users. So I think there's some really interesting stuff in the regulation that's upcoming in the UK and in Europe. I think it puts transparency at the heart, which is really exciting. It, it kind of reshifts the incentives for platforms to think about risks at the product design stage rather than after the disasters happened, as we were talking about earlier, just acting retroactively. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that we can see some really, um, really beneficial changes to the information ecosystem from the regulatory drafts we've got at the moment. That's very interesting. Will, what do you feel I mean, about trying to avoid having to be arbiters of what's true and what isn't true? I'm nowhere near as optimistic as Chloe. Um, I think that the online safety bill before the UK Parliament essentially says, well, this is a very hard problem. Ofcom should go away and solve it. And Ofcom is a government appointed regulator with a heavy level of political interference in who is appointed to run it. And it's not not at all clear that they have the independence necessary to make such sensitive decisions. We've sort of touched on throughout this uh, conversation, the actor behavior content way of thinking about misinformation. And I think the bill is far too focused on content, what content is not acceptable and what should be done about it. 
And actually, Chloe's absolutely right. We need a much more principles-based approach. We need a, an approach that works out who is uh, behaving in ways that harm others and what behaviour does Parliament, not a government-appointed regulator, but Parliament, our democratically elected representatives, want to intervene to stop. But we also need regulation because government is already censoring the internet by proxy. What they do is they go to the internet companies, they say, you should change your terms and conditions to stop people sharing certain kinds of content, and then you should enforce those and take down certain kinds of content. And that is exactly how they responded, for example, to the spate of misinformation about 5G. Rather than combat it with good information and strong public health information, they just lent on the internet companies, said change your terms and conditions, change your algorithms, and start taking it down. And we know they did this because they released a press release about it. They don't think that's a problem. They think it's something they should tell journalists that they are doing. Now, if we want to live in a free society with an open internet, we have to regulate not just what the internet companies do, but how governments can use them to control the conversations of ordinary internet users. Because ultimately, in the long run, the best guarantee of informed public debate is freedom of expression. So I think we have a bill which is in danger of overreach, which is too focused on content and which gives far too much power to unelected officials in a public body. And unless Parliament scrutinises it far more carefully than it does, there's a real risk of it overreaching, even though every one of the benefits Chloe talked about is possible in this bill. We're just having to put too much faith in people we shouldn't have to put faith in in a free society. And just to end, Laura is absolutely right about transparency. The folly of this entire conversation is that we're f flying blind. We do not know enough about the problem to have a successful diagnosis, to have a successful solution. And that is because the internet companies block other people's access to the information that is necessary to understand the problem and design good policy. Laura. So Will has made an incredibly compelling principled argument for why policies that are too content focused are, are wrongheaded. I want to make a practical argument for why they are wrongheaded. Mm -hmm. The reason that I advocate so strongly for transparency, and I don't really advocate for anything else, is because without transparency, we just don't know how to make good recommendations for what else will solve the problem. And this isn't a theoretical problem, right? I think one of the things that we have learned from the Facebook papers is a lot of Facebook's current problems stem from a change that was made in 2018 to make um, commenting on your friends' posts more important. This sounds great in theory to encourage meaningful social interaction, right? This sounds great. And what we see is that the impact of that change was terrible for platform health. It was really, really negative. And so the problem is that if you want to, you know, there are a lot of proposals that sound great in theory, but we just don't know what impact they would have. And the idea of encoding any of these things in law without knowing what the impact of those changes might be, whether they were content-based approaches or network-based approaches or targeting-based approaches. I find that really scary. And I think that is why right now I am so focused on transparency because I don't know how to make good recommendations for what might make these platforms safer because I just don't have the data. Sandra, what about what do you feel about the regulation? Yeah, I think there's two interesting extremes here. First, I should say I'm not a policy analyst. So whenever I get the question about regulation, you know, I personally have a view on regulation, but I think there's also an interesting discussion uh, going on. I think the first is this constant suggestion from social media companies that we need to help people spot fake news. And, and I think they invest a lot of research in it. Uh, and I think it's a good thing. But I'm always wondering if, you know, we don't want to shift the blame fully onto people so that it becomes an excuse for them to say, oh, look, we're helping people do better at spotting fake news without having to be an arbiter of truth, without having to do any transparency, because it's people who are the problem, right? Whereas the other angle is, no, it's social media companies who are the problem. Um, you know, and then they say, oh, but look, the diversity of your network is far more important than any algorithmic filtering that we do. It's about your choices. You choose not to have friends from the other side. You choose to post things on our platform. You choose to become a member of our social network. You choose what you watch on YouTube. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it, this debate is very interesting to me. Um, and now I'll say that 
my sense is that yes, we need to we need to help people and train people because we can't always rely on the government or social media companies to to change things for the better. And so you know, it would be good if if if, if people uh, were empowered uh, to make informed decisions to the best of our ability. But I think at the same time, we also need to address the issues that were raised here. I think transparency. I agree, it's it's absolutely key. I have a stack of NDAs. Um, and so, you know, all my internal knowledge about how these platforms works are useless because I have to sign NDAs, right? And it would be great if this was public knowledge um, and if people, um, it could help researchers actually do something with it. I know that the companies say, oh, but we've given access to data before and look what happened. Um, lots of bad things happened when we gave people access to, to Facebook data and, th and so on. Um, and so, you know, clearly there's practical questions to be solved about who gets the data and what form. Uh, um, and, 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 you know, Facebook coming back and saying, oh, we've released lots of data. By the way, it was actually wrong or we gave you half the data set, um, right? And so uh, th there are lots of practical issues there. Um, and then on the question of, you know, you, we, we talked a lot about YouTube. YouTube doesn't work with outside scientists. There are true black box, at least Facebook and Twitter and so on. They, they have academic consultants and they take input. YouTube, period, this doesn't work with outside scientists. I have to go through Google if I want YouTube to read something. Um, um, for example, because you know Google owns YouTube and and they are interested, but they have to convince um, some of the platforms that they own to, to do things. And and so I don't know. I'm I, I'm I think we need transparency about how these platforms work. I think we need open data. Um, and at the same time, I'm not personally too worried about the arguments against free speech and content moderation. I mean, the internet had moderators from the very beginning um, in terms of its its content. Um, right. It wasn't it wasn't the wild, wild west. We've always had moderators and blogs and, you know, in order to ensure civilized discussions and things like that. Um, so I'm not too worried. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I agree with the argument that, you know, we don't want censorship and, and things like that. And, and there's there's examples of um, YouTube just taking down extremist content and by accident shutting down lots of educational channels because the algorithm flagged it as misinformation about, let's say, World War II. Well, in fact, it was an educational video about Hitler and not necessarily a propaganda channel. Um, and so, again, I think it comes it comes back to the to, to the practical question and maybe what everyone else was saying about actually how to actually implement this. Um, but yeah, just to, to round up my answer. Um, I would I would fully agree on the transparency issue. I think we need transparency. And then I think we need to solve some practical questions um, about how to actually implement um, some of the things which, you know, computer scientists and others are much bet better suited than me to answer those questions. OK, um, I think we're coming to an end. A extraordinary discussion, which I've learned so much from about, you know, who's creating the content the way that content can be amplified and spread around and how groups are trying to tackle that in different ways. But particularly this final discussion about the role for regulation and uh, possibly the importance of transparency, the difficulty of arbitrating about what's true content and what isn't. Um, and and finally, I think, you know, Sandra's point that, you know, this is not just one thing or the other. We do have to empower people. We do have to improve education of how to deal how to deal with these things to spot what, what's being done to us all the time but that in itself is certainly not going to be sufficient so i'd like to uh, thank our phenomenal panel of info warriors uh, chloe laura will and sander and thank them so much for giving me up, up their valuable time to talk to us about this absolutely vital topic so it's goodbye from me and the whole risky talk team Thank you.